Hey guys, welcome back. So this video is a little bit unplanned, but after watching the previous video, I decided to spend a little more time on a basis. And the reason why I want to spend a little more time is because we need to make sure that we understand what a basis is before we move on. Because later on, this idea of a basis is going to come back uh, when we start talking about transformations and changing coordinates. And if we don't have a solid understanding of what a basis is, it may be a little bit difficult. So basically what I'm going to do in this video is just present the same material as the previous video, but I'm going to present it in a little bit different way. So just to recap, a basis for a space spans the entire space. And we went over that in the previous video. And we also said that a basis contains linearly independent vectors. So when we put these two criteria together, what we get is a basis represents the fewest number of vectors that it takes to span an entire space. So the basis contains a set of vectors that is large enough to span the space that it is a basis for, but it's small enough to where it only contains linearly independent vectors. So that's why I say that it represents the fewest number of vectors that it takes to span an entire space. It's not too big, but it's also not too small. The other piece of info that we can get from these uh, two statements is that a basis is the fewest number of vectors that it takes to construct every other vector in the space. So what I mean by this is if we have a space W, uh, it's a subspace of Rn, then what this means is our basis vectors can be used to construct every single vector that exists in W. So every element, every, every vector in W can be represented, I'll write it like this, every vector in W can be represented as the linear combinations of our basis. So if we have n basis vectors for our subspace of Rn, then we can write every single vector that exists within our subspace as linear combinations of our basis vectors. In other words, we can construct every single vector in our subspace W in terms of our basis vectors. And also, since each basis vector is linearly independent, then the number of basis vectors that we have in our basis represents the dimension of our space or subspace that we are interested in. For example, if we have a space W and the basis for this space is the set B1, B2, and B3, then we know that W is three-dimensional because each of these basis vectors is guaranteed to be linearly independent. Therefore, we know that the space that these basis vectors span has to be three-dimensional. So this means that W is three-dimensional. And the other thing that we can say because of this fact is that W is equal to the span of our basis vectors. So in this case, if we are considering a basis for W being B1, B2, and B3, then our, we know that our space W is equal to the span of B1, B2, and B3. And that's because, once again, every single vector in W, which I have right here, every single vector in W can be represented as linear combinations of our basis vectors. So let's take a look at the vector space R2. And typically we take the standard basis of R2 to be the i and j unit vectors, which point along the x and y axis. So these two vectors, i and j, these are a basis for R2. And that's because these two vectors are linearly independent and they span 
the entire space of R2. Another way that we can think about a basis is like a coordinate system. So these two basis vectors create a coordinate system that span this entire space. So let me draw this out. So basically our coordinate system looks like a grid where each line lies along um, one of the basis vectors. So this is the kind of grid we get. And since we're working with the standard basis, what we get is the Cartesian coordinate system that we are used to. But now let's say that we change our basis. Let's pick a different basis. Technically, there's an infinite amount of bases that we can select. They just have to satisfy the criteria for a basis, meaning they just have to span the entire space and they have to be linearly independent. Or in other words, every vector in the space must be able to be represented by a combination of our basis vectors. And the number of basis vectors has to be small enough so we're not including any linearly dependent vectors. So anyway, I can select this guy and this guy as my new basis. And we can see that these don't lie along the same line, so we know they're linearly independent. And we also know that since there's two of them, they span R2. But if I were to draw out a coordinate system uh, according to these basis vectors, I would get this transformed coordinate system that looks something like this. And still, you can see that it does, in fact, span the entire space of R2, but now our coordinate system is kind of warped. So another way to think about a basis is a coordinate system. It's, these vectors are a basis for the coordinate system that defines a space. So in general, a basis for a vector space Rn, so an n-dimensional vector space, a basis for that has n basis vectors. If we had greater than n vectors, then this would mean that we are including linearly dependent vectors. So we can't have greater than n, and we also can't have less than n, because otherwise our basis would not span all of Rn. So that's why we have to have n basis vectors um, if we want a basis for Rn. So hopefully that clears up any questions you may have had after watching the previous video. And if you guys have any more questions about this or any other topic that we've covered so far, feel free to leave a comment or send me a message. You can do so here on YouTube or you can reach me on Facebook uh, or even Twitter. Or if you want, you can even send me an email. It doesn't matter. So anyway, thanks for watching and I will see you guys in the next video.